Labour described the accusations as deeply troubling, saying they raised more questions about Mr Sunak's judgment by appointing him. Levelling up Shadow Minister Alex Norris says bullying shouldn't happen in government. It's cowards that bully their staff, people who, in that power imbalance, can't really do very much about it and simply have to put up with uh, what, what we've seen happen. I mean, uh, obviously, we're, we're only reading in the last uh, sort of 24 hours some of the issues relating to the Deputy Prime Minister and what he may or may not have thrown, and it's important that that's given the full airing. But we do know what happened with Gavin Williamson, that's accepted. But fundamentally, I just don't think they should do that, and I don't really think that that should be very controversial. Counting continues in the U.S. midterm elections with the race for control of the U.S. Congress neck and neck. Republicans are favourites to win the House of Representatives, securing 211 seats. They need an additional seven seats to secure a majority. But the fight for the Senate is on the edge, with both Republicans and Democrats having 50 votes. The biggest concerns for voters are the economy and abortion rights. The women's England rugby team have suffered heartbreak after losing to New Zealand in the World Cup final. England's Red Roses dominated the first half, but their rivals, the Black Ferns, came back strong, scoring a try in the last nine minutes to give a 34-31 victory. The final broke the record for the biggest attendance for a women's rugby match, with more than 40,000 tickets sold. Fans say despite the loss, they're still proud of the team. It could have gone either way for quite a lot of the game, so I think in this room everyone was just really passionate about England women and the love for Lightning Girls here, so um, we're all pretty gutted, but we're also really proud of everyone out there. Like It's a massive honour for them to represent the Rose and put on a great performance like they did today. Renowned graffiti artist Banksy has revealed his latest artwork on the side of a damaged building in Ukraine. It shows a female gymnast balancing on her hands on rubble at the bottom of a destroyed building. Murals spotted in and around Kyiv has led to speculation the artist is working in the war-torn country. Another not yet officially claimed by Banksy shows the Russian president being flipped during a judo match with a young boy. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, though, it's back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Here's what's coming up over this next hour. Bereaved families will be forced to pay an extra one billion quid in death duties if Rishi Sunak extends the freeze on inheritance tax thresholds for another two years. Is this yet another unconservative policy imposed by a supposedly conservative Prime Minister? Let me know. And nurses in the Royal College of Nursing Union have voted for its first UK-wide strike in its entire 106-year history. Rishi Sunak has said that the 17% pay rise requested by a nursing union that's voted to strike isn't affordable. And I tell you what, stop the £11 billion in climate change payments abroad and give that to our nurses instead, Rishi. And later, a report from Oxford University shows that China has emitted more carbon emissions over the past eight years than the United Kingdom has since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So why should the UK be paying climate change reparations to China? That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, your thoughts are much more important than mine. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. I've got it open here, so please be kind. You can watch us online on YouTube and cheers very much. Now, if I wasn't cancelled before, I probably will be after this. The left likes to claim that we're a nation of immigrants. The truth is that from 1066, for about 900 years, that wasn't the case. In fact, when large groups of people came here before then, it was usually in the form of invasions. The Vikings and the Normans arrived here in pursuit of a better life in England's green and pleasant land. But the pursuit of a better life doesn't mean it was in the citizens' best interests already here. In 1066, historians reckon the armies numbered between five to 7,000 on each side. Well, folks, GB News has seen evidence of 6,000 migrants waiting near the Channel Coast in northwest France as UK authorities brace for a surge in small boat crossings this very weekend. 
And in my view, this is, as Home Secretary Suella Braverman has suggested, in the face of, let's not forget, fierce left-wing hysteria, an invasion. The left argues that Brexit Britain has already failed because we have no longer free movement of people from the EU. Whilst a whopping 5 million British people languish on out-of-work welfare. That's according to the Department of Work and Pensions. And for much too long in this country, in my view, big business has had a free lunch, able to pick and choose, like a pick and mix, from the EU labour market, which migrant it fancies, foregoing the cost of upskilling and retraining British nationals. They cannot do that anymore. That's thanks to Brexit. And I tell you what, I for one rejoice at that news. Imagine it, right? Five million people are inactive in the labour market. I think they ought to be our priority. It ought to be the British people that we seek to help and assist before we even think about aiding those who have precious little regard, frankly, for the laws of the land by brazenly waltzing over the border to get here, with some of them running off to get up to goodness only knows what. And this is all whilst Rishi Sunak ludicrously doles out £11 billion pursuing green dogma through renewable energy investments in development countries. I'd like to see British business dole out sums like £11 billion on a cause much more worthwhile and close at home. The second chances of five million British citizens. And this is, of course, coming at a time when we are rightly commemorating our war dead and those injured in the quest to defend the values represented in our nation's flag. Are we doing enough for our veterans? I'm not convinced we are. We must ensure we're doing all we can for our people already here before considering economic migrants who fancy working in Britain. Ask yourself, what would those like Peter Grimes think, a distant relative of mine from County Durham? He signed himself up for the British Army to fight in the Great War, only to be tragically killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Would he recognise the nation that he so selflessly sacrificed himself to defend? Today, we can only imagine Peter's sheer horror on that one single day. And I want this to be a nation worthy of Peter's death. Do you not? I want this to be a nation that recognises the plight of the British people. Because at a time when Arthur and Martha cannot afford to put the heating on, is it wise for our Prime Minister to flock alongside 400 private jets to Egypt to virtue signal with United Nations world leaders at COP or CON27. I'm not convinced that it is, folks. It's about time our British politicians started to fight to defend the interests of the British people. We're not asking of them the same sacrifice that Peter Grimes offered, only that they prioritise us for once. Because I tell you what, to those in the House of Commons, you cannot dare grumble about the NHS, about schools, about accommodation, if you back open borders migration across the English Channel. Because ask yourself this, where are the hospitals? Where are the school places? And where are the homes to house those that you reckon we should be taking in once they cross the Channel in pursuit of a better life? They simply don't exist. Britain cannot afford to be the welfare wingman to everyone that wants to come here. So if you ask me my clarion call today, it's time for a recalibration of the priorities of the British political class. Because I tell you now, if this Conservative government doesn't recognise that soon, then what's going to come down the line? This bounce in the polls for Richard Tice's Reform UK, it's going to go on like Tigger until it denies the Conservative Party the chance of forming a government for an entire generation. Now, according to analysis by the wealth manager Quilter, bereaved families are going to have to pay an extra £1 billion in death duties if, as is expected, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt announces an extension to the freeze on inheritance tax thresholds for another two years 
in his autumn statement next week. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak froze inheritance thresholds until 2026 when he was Chancellor. But in order to plug its £50 billion fiscal black hole, it's understood the government will push ahead with this so-called stealth tax raid. So to debate this, I'm joined by the head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden, and the former Labour advisor and writer, Scarlett Maguire. Scarlett, can I start with you, please? Do you see inheritance tax as a, as a fair tax, as a tax that, you know, is on the side of those pursuing equality and opportunity? Yeah, I, I do see inheritance tax as a progressive tax, right? Is, 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 is that it, it, uh, it, it certainly doesn't take away money from the rich or from the children of the rich, but actually it, it, it is about the broadest shoulders. And, and it is a way of taxing people without actually hitting their day-to-day -day incomes. Um, but but I, I, I mean, I don't see it as 100%, but I do think that it's absolutely fair that at a time of terrible, terrible economic problems, many actually caused by the present government, um, that, that we, do, we do freeze uh, tax bans and, and in particular in inheritance tax, because actually that's not hitting people's day to day living. That's not hitting the way pe whether people can pay, you know, for their food, for their for their for, for, for their heating and lighting. It's about uh, money coming down the track. OK, Christopher Snowden. Is it your view that it's not right that someone that's worked hard all of their life to pass on per potentially opportunities to the next generation of their family, is it wrong for the state to say, well, I'll be having that, thank you very much? No, actually, I don't think it is. I don't think that's a good objection to inheritance tax. The idea that you know, people often say, well, I've already paid the, the tax on this money. You can say that about all the money you spend. I mean, every time a money changes hands, it generally gets taxed. You know, you get taxed on your salary and then you go to a shop and you you buy something and you pay the VAT on it. You don't say, well, I've already been taxed on this money. The money's been taxed many, many times before. Um, I mean, personally, I, I don't want to see people paying more tax full stop. I'd like to see a, a smaller state and greater economic growth. And I believe that that is, that is possible. But we have to tax something. Um, and actually, particularly given the huge amount of house price inflation over the last 20 years, um, I think it's a pretty, pretty good thing to, to be taxing is unearned housing wealth. Not many people actually pay inheritance tax uh, as it is. I think it's only something like 4% of, of, of families uh, who've had a bereavement. But it's incredibly unpopular. And we saw that with Theresa May in 2017, who actually came up with quite a sensible way to pay for social care. But people felt it, this is a government taking your house off you. The reality is people live so long generally these days that when people in, inherit these houses, they've already got a house. They've probably paid the mortgage on the house that they're living in. So they're being given at the age of you know 60 or even 70, they're being given a house they don't need, which they then sell. Um, so it's not as if they're even usually you know, living in, in the, the house they grew up in, anything like that. It's just a, a windfall. I mean, Scarlett, I want to put to you what Alex Davis of the Wealth Club has said. He said it's not actually going to be the super rich, right, who feel the pinch of, of a stealth tax like this, but it's going to be thousands of hardworking families who get caught in the crosshairs of a high property price. And, you know, it's not their fault their property prices have shot through the roof, unless, of course, they're standing saying, absolutely no way, Jose, you won't build here. And the frozen inheritance tax allowance, that's going to clobber working families, isn't it? Now, the whole thing about inheritance tax is it doesn't clobber you at the, t at the moment, right? What it does is it, is, is it just lessens some of the money coming down the track. I mean, I, I completely agree with the Institute of Economic Affairs that actually house prices have just got ridiculous. And, and certainly if you live in London, I barely know. I know one person under 40 who's bought their own house on their own money. Everybody else has used their parents' money either because they died or because their parents are rich. I mean, I'm somebody who will be very much affected. I mean, you know, if I die tomorrow, my children will have to sell the house. There's, there's no question about it. And neither of them, uh, for ridiculous reasons, uh, have their own houses, right? And, and absolutely right. By the time my parents both died and I inherited anything, I'd paid off my mortgage. So that wasn't a problem. And I think, I mean, it's not about 
hitting hardworking families. It's about it's about saying that you know that for a lot of people, house prices have given them unearned wealth. Right? It's 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 they were lucky. We were lucky. I mean, the people I know who I have to say to, I bought in London when I was young. That's why I can afford to live here, and and it's about luck. So, and I, I mean, when we say we're just going to freeze it, I mean, it's not as though we're putting in punitive amounts. We're just going to freeze it. The first three hundred and twenty-five thousand, you'll still get. The rest will be taxed, right? So, and I think it's taxed at forty percent. So, the rest will be taxed, and you'll still get half of it. So, it's not that people will be losing every penny. It is that some of it will be going to the state? And as the Institute of Economic Affairs said, I mean, something has to be done about people with dementia, about social care. Yeah, Somehow social care. Can pay for exactly. That. Well, Scarlett, I never thought I'd see the day when you agree with the Institute of Economic Affairs, but what strange <laughs> times we live in. <laughs> Christopher Snowden, I just want, finally, if I can just ask you, I remember back in the day this was painted by the Conservative Party as a death tax, right, when Gordon Brown was potentially flirting with these kind of proposals. What is it that's changed that means that the Conservative Party now looks at this as actually one form of taxation that it can get away with not increasing, but certainly freezing the threshold of? Well, I think it's because they're freezing the th threshold. You know, people won't notice it as much. It's a very stealthy way of, of getting more money. And they're not just doing this with inheritance tax. They're doing this really across the, the board, income tax in particular. So, you know, the government actually quietly, quite likes inflation. There's a lot of benefits to the government of inflation. It can inflate, inflate away the debt and it can get much more money in through um, through the tax system thanks to fiscal drag, which is a very subtle way of doing it. There's no way, I don't think, even now, that the Conservatives would say we're going to whack up inheritance tax explicitly. Um, you know, you had, the, as you say, they used to call it the death tax. Labour called the social care, uh, social care plan in 2017 of Theresa May's called that dementia tax. Uh, you've talked already about bereaved families. You know, when you put it in this very emotive language, then of course it's unpopular. And, you know, taxes in general, of course, are, are unpopular. But yeah, we're going to see this across the board, this fiscal drag. People aren't going to notice it so much. But that 10% inflation that we've got, probably higher by now, um, it actually does the government uh, several favours because it allows them to get money more subtly while also inflating away the debt. But it's normal people, of course, who pay, pay the cost. Uh, but they pay the cost in many more insidious ways than you know a few more people paying inheritance tax, I would say. Yeah. Scarlett, just very, very briefly, if you would, I'm just wondering, a lot of people say, uh, writing in to me and saying things like, well, look, Darren, when I originally got my mortgage out yes i've paid it off now but when i took my mortgage out it was double digits in interest rates right the, the the idea that i didn't struggle to buy my own house is an absurdity what do you say to those people i'm one of them i mean i i i, I bought i bought my house in the 80s and i had double di digit uh thing and and it was incredibly tough i mean i was a single mom yeah. I was a freelance journalist. It was very tough. I paid it. I, I paid the mortgage off, um, but I do not think that that means that my children should should get everything for free. I, I think that we have to pay for things, and this is a good way and a fair way of doing it. Okay, folks. Well, we'll leave it with that agreement between the IEA and Scarlett Maguire. They're extraordinary scenes. But the head of the lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden there, and former Labour advisor and writer Scarlett Maguire. Thank you both very much. Now, folks, plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. After this short break, nurses in the Royal College of Nursing Union have voted for its first UK-wide strike in its 106-year history. And Rishi Sunak has said we cannot possibly pay a 17% pay rise requested by the union. But how's the government going to actually sort this out? We'll discuss. First of all, though, let's have a look what the weather's getting up to. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, with some cloud in the far east and west. Let's take a look at the details. A dry but cloudy evening for most of southwest England, with low cloud and perhaps fog possible over the hills, clearer spells at times, and breezy, particularly at the coasts. 
Cloudy for some in southeast England with light winds, allowing some mist and fog to develop under any clearer spells, particularly in the east. Wales will see a cloudy evening on Saturday with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible over the hills, breezy at western coasts. Staying dry across the Midlands with plenty of clear skies in the evening and overnight, a little breezy at times but feeling mild with temperatures around 13 Celsius. Northeast England will see a cloudy evening, although some clearer spells at times, some low cloud, mist and fog possible, particularly at eastern coast. Light winds and temperatures of 11 or 12 Celsius. Staying dry across most of Scotland with some patchy cloud in places, although outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible in the far west. Generally light winds, but breezy in the west. A cloudy evening across Northern Ireland with some patchy mist and fog, although a few clearer spells possible in the east, feeling breezy, particularly at the coasts and over high ground. Staying dry for most, although patchy rain and drizzle in the east, some clearer spells and breezy in the west. And that's how it's shaping up overnight. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and your digital radio. Now, for the first time in its 106-year history, the Royal College of Nursing has called on its 300,000 members to walk out after a majority of nurses voted in favour of strike action. They could soon be joined on the picket line by paramedics, who are also set to be balloted on strike action in the coming weeks. And if that happens, it's reported that the army will be drafted in to drive ambulances and assist on 999 calls, much like they did during the coronavirus pandemic. The Prime Minister has also said that the nurses' union's demands are completely unaffordable. So to tell us more, I'm joined by the health and social affairs editor at the Sunday Express, Lucy Johnston. Lucy, thank you very much for your time. Could you start off by telling us why nurses have voted for strike action and what the demands are? Are you viewing it as likely that they'll strike some kind of halfway house, maybe? I think it's likely they may have to in the end, but um, I think morale has never been so low. And I think they are also striking because of 
as they say, 10 years of real term, real wage cuts in real terms. So over the last 10 years, um, they've uh, had their pay not in line with inflation, not increase. And so they're effectively doing one day extra a week for free. So they're trying to claw back that. And I think they've reached a tipping point and they must be pretty angry because nurses don't uh, don't do this easily. They don't want to harm patients at all. So, but I, as we know, the uh, the prime minister has already said that that's not. It would equate to nine billion pounds. What they're asking for, seventeen point six percent pay rise, um, and he said that's unaffordable. Yeah, I mean, Lucy, what would your message be to viewers who are saying, "Well, hang on a minute, I've got a appointment at my local hospital." coming up soon. I'm really worried that actually it's going to get cancelled at a time when we are facing backlogs, right? The NHS is under immense strain. Is now really the time for nurses to be going off on strike? I think we're coming into midwinter. Um, we've got the double whammy of COVID and other respiratory infections. Um, uh, we have an immune debt because of the lockdown. So we didn't get exposed to pathogens during there. So we have a bigger pool of people who will be vulnerable and susceptible to infection. We also have a record waiting lists and record numbers of people who are seeking care. The system has been running uh, at it's, it's been higher, higher demand since August, really, in many places, and it's not let up. So that's that's summer. We're coming into winter, and I I think it is a really bad time to go into a strike um, because we're going to have an increase in demand, and, and it looks like the emergency health system could just well collapse because many patients, if they can't get appointments, if they're waiting, if they're struggling, they just end up in A&E, which, as we know, is already overwhelmed. So how likely do you think it's going to be that we do see members of the British Army, the armed forces, acting as paramedics because the paramedics have gone on strike too? It's hard to say. I mean, it depends where you are in the country. Many hospitals... Uh, will they do that they, they will get round things and um, we know that you know uh, locums may be drafted in we've just seen last week in the press I think um, uh, hospitals are paying up to 2500 pounds a shift for locums which is obviously costing the NHS more um, I think some parts of the country where there are higher waiting lists and where there are more nurses who are part of the union who have agreed to strike they will be facing more problems and they include the southwest Devon Cornwall I think Birmingham as well and there's some new research out just in the last 24 hours that um, suggests around nine around three million people will um, have to have surgeries postponed. So those people will have to wait. Yeah, I mean, Lucy, just very, very briefly, if you would, uh, one of my viewers has emailed in saying that the NHS has spent in excess of £480 million last year recruiting staff through agencies. I don't know if that figure uh, is, a, a, you know, the accurate one. I'm not I haven't got the figures in front of me. But the, the fact that agencies are being paid this money, I'm asking... And my viewer is asking, why don't we just give that to nurses? Well, exactly. But it's all to do with, uh, you know, nurses are sort of, they, they move on, don't they? They get fed up and then they move to other hospitals. Some nurses are leaving. And when you haven't got a nurse to fill a shift, the hospitals are having to take the action of, of getting in a locum because otherwise it's less safe to run. So the system, I mean, we've had five health secretaries in just I know, two years. I know. So they're coming in if they're going in the jungle, um, we need to have someone that has a long-term view and looks at the bigger picture and gets to understand it properly. No one's looking at the fundamental problems within the health service, yeah. which include an IT system that doesn't talk to each other. So hospitals can't talk to GP surgeries, even within regions. We've got um, a working week, which stops pretty much or large part of it at the weekend. So we've got an increase in death rates around the weekend of about 10 or 11 percent and also that that leads to a blocking in the system and it stops the flow we've got as you know social care where people are not able to get 
decent uh, help in the community or decent care in the community. So they're about 10% of people in hospital yeah, beds. Lucy, it at needs moment. stability, doesn't it? That's what it needs. It needs a, a health secretary who's actually going to be in the post longer than how long was Therese Coffey in there. It's obscene. But Lucy, we're going to have to leave it there. Lucy Johnson, Health and Social Affairs Editor at the Sunday Express. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAV radio. I thank you very much for being so. After the break, a report from Oxford University shows that China has emitted more carbon dioxide over the past eight years than the United Kingdom has since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So I'm asking, why should the UK be paying climate change reparations to China? It's obscene. Now it's time for a check on the news headlines, though, with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Here are the headlines at 2.33. There have been scenes of jubilation across Ukraine after the liberation of the city of Kherson from Russian control. Kherson was the only regional capital city captured by Russian troops since the invasion began in February. Vladimir Putin's spokesperson has denied the move is a defeat, saying the region remains part of Russian territory after it was annexed in September. Ukraine's foreign minister says there isn't a single indicator that Russia is sincerely seeking peace talks. Large groups of migrants have clashed with French police near Dunkirk after the authorities stopped their attempts to cross the channel. Migrants have been seen attacking French police officers with stones and tree branches. Meanwhile, the force used pepper spray to push them back. GB News has learnt the vast majority of migrants are young men with one or two women and children. Meanwhile, dozens of Albanian nationals are protesting in central London against the British government's immigration policies. Many are still furious about the Home Secretary's comments earlier this month when she likened the number of Albanian asylum seekers arriving in the UK to an invasion. Close to 40,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Britain and France are expected to agree a deal as soon as Monday to ramp up their joint efforts to reduce the numbers. Tory MPs have come out in defence of a Deputy Prime Minister after he was accused of being rude and aggressive towards civil servants. It's reported that multiple sources have alleged Dominic Raab created a culture of fear in his previous role as Justice Secretary. Labour described the accusations as deeply troubling, saying they raise more questions about Mr Sunak's judgement by appointing him. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Back to Darren in just a few moments. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let well, him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. 
And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and your digital radio. Now, a report from Oxford University's Our World in Data project has found that China has emitted more carbon dioxide over the past eight years than the United Kingdom has since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which started, as you well know, in the middle of the 18th century. According to the report, the United Kingdom emitted 78 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide between 1750 and 2020, a figure that pales in comparison to China, which has emitted some 80 billion tonnes since 2013. Well, to break this all down, I'm joined, I'm delighted to say, by senior lecturer in sustainable construction and climate change, John Grant. John, surely you share the frustration of many of my viewers who are getting in touch right now and they're saying, Darren, Arthur's and Martha's in Britain are too afraid to put the heating on this winter, but China's burning more coal than Sauron's Mordor. How is that right? Well, it's not. No, no, nobody is saying China is right. I mean, oh, the, the, the challenges that we are up against at the moment uh, is a legion. You know, we have a climate catastrophe, our ecology is collapsing, and China is ignoring, for the most part, any immediate action. But, and I suppose there has to be a but, you know, the UK may have not emitted as much as China, but we still are the eighth largest emitter of carbon dioxide around the world since that period. So, you know, there is some responsibility. And we did sort of start this. And of course, my well, not of course, but my my research, this idea that we started the Industrial Revolution and maybe we could we could help countries to move to a post-carbon economy where we could have another industrial revolution, but one that doesn't burn the planet. You know, just an idea. And we can do that. Yeah, so I'm wondering then, I mean, this report also found that since 1990, the United Kingdom, which is, it, this isn't the narrative that we often hear, but the United Kingdom has actually reduced its carbon dioxide output the fastest amongst any other industrialised nation, with CO2 emissions falling by 54.8%. Some of my viewers, it's, there's a split on this, some of my viewers are saying, well, Darren, if you get rid of every you know, energy intensive industry in Britain, of course your carbon emissions are going to fall. And the other side say, happy, hunky dory, happy days, aren't we clever, we're doing amazing things. Where are you? Well, well, you know, it, it's both of those things, isn't it? We've closed, I think, virtually all of it, if not all of our coal fired power stations, which are a big chunk. I, I, I'm not sure if we're above 50%, I, but you know, but it is around 50%. Uh, and the other one is that, that heavy industry. And, and I'm sat here in Sheffield, the birthplace of mass steel production. And there are ways of making steel without producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. And, and I am staggered that we are not funded by our government and the steel industry. And part of that is because it's foreign, isn't it? That, that you know, internalizing that so we could produce zero carbon steel, which will have an enormous value as we go forward. So, you know, I'm here to, to, to say that, yes, there is a huge problem and we are part of that, but there are amazing solutions that we could project forwards with all of our industrial know-how. We don't have the might that we used to have, but we are you know, some incredible scientists and material scientists out there that can, that can do the job and make some money here in the UK for a change. I'll have a bit so, of that. Yeah, I mean, John, I'm assuming then by your rhetoric there, talking about the positives that we've made, the advancements that we've made, you're not going to be gluing yourself to any of our motorways anytime soon. Well, I am desperately disappointed with the fact that the UK government is still giving licenses to explore for new oil and gas fields. That, that, in, in this situation where we're trying to head down to zero carbon by 2050, this to me is just scientifically 
well, it's close to insanity. You know, we should be looking at the opportunities of really cheap renewable energy and battery technology that isn't lithium based that can supply to our grids, which is out there, but also needs research. What we don't need is more oil and gas and certainly not not fracking, which we just have no idea what the reserve is like. We just have an idea that it's out there. And it's, you know, how about we go with what we're certain about, which All is right. that the wind will blow. Yeah. The sun will shine. I don't, do, I don't doubt that for a second. The wind will blow often in this country, the sun shining less frequent. Yeah. But I'm wondering, though, okay. I'm wondering, a lot of my viewers struggling, they're too terrified, actually, to put the heating on at this time. And they hear you, John, and I say this with all the respect in the world, they hear you saying we shouldn't be exploring new gas sites here in this country when actually that could alleviate the burden on them because your wind turbines aren't going to power my viewers' gas boilers, are they? Well, you know, that's a really, really good point. And they are, have every right to be frustrated. Well, angry, forget frustrated. But do you know what? What hasn't been done is helping these people reduce how much energy they use with a proper campaign to improve their energy efficiency. It's generally accepted that we can reduce how much energy we use in our homes by around 60%. And I think most people would prefer to, to reduce the amount of energy they, they get than get than pay some foreign power company a certain amount of money forever rather than, than, do, than, than, than reduce the, that through energy efficiency. So the solution, of course, is to help the poorest now. It's desperate. It's absolutely desperate. Um, but, you know, to improve their homes, which we can do, which I can do. I built the first house 20 years ago that had no heating in it. I know you won't believe me, but it's true. It has no primary heating in it at all. And it has never gone below 18 degrees in 20 years of people living in it. Zero. Zero. Yeah. And it costs so, no more to build than a normal house. And that's, I assume that's down to some super good insulation, is it not? Indeed. Yeah. So that's the answer. I agree with you. We need to yes. insulate British homes better because we're all drafty and what have you. But the realities are that this is the reality of life that we live in, right? This is the, the state of things as they are now. So right now, we need gas in that transition period to net zero. Do you accept that at least? Well, and, and yeah, I'm not saying stop using fossil fuels. That, that would be, well, people would die. What I'm saying is we, we, we don't want to look for 10 years in the future, which is what new oil and gas fields are really talking about. You could maybe get them online a small amount within five years, but the major amounts would be somewhere between five and 10 years. And in that period, I could, with a proper program, save people much more energy than, than us hunting out more. So yeah, we have to use some coal and that's uh, not coal oil and gas these people's oil and gas thing but we are transitioning to an electric only world and it's going to happen if we're going to meet this zero carbon and what we have to do is to head in that direction without breaking the system yeah and, and if we just try and flip it from one to the other it will you're right it'll just break we have well, to John, prepare for this just just finally i wonder if you might mm -hmm. answer this question the of course. what what is the the point of uh, basically just exporting our emissions, which strikes me that's what we've done. Saying actually, energy intensive industry, let's send it all to China, give them the jobs, and they can emit the carbon emissions. Whilst we here in this country, we're at what one percent of global CO two, yeah, yeah. and we here pat ourselves on the back and say, "Oh, goody, goody, we've got rid of all of our jobs and sent them across to China, who are therefore then taking on our burden of carbon." What's the point in that? Yeah, well, you've nailed it, mate. You you know it. This is completely out of order. You know, they are building a power station every other week, I think, that's fired by coal. This is this is wrong. We we have the know-how, we have the potential. We've now, for good or not, left Europe. We have control of our industrial capacity. What well, we need me, now not is a proper program to expand that. Yeah, perfect. John, we'll end it there. Senior Lecturer in Sustainable Construction and Climate Change, John Grant there. Thank you very much for your time.
Now, folks, the US midterms took place this week, and four days after polls closed, who's going to get control of Congress remains unclear. Control of the Senate now hinges on the outcome of Nevada and Georgia, and my next guest will tell me if I've got that wrong. Meanwhile, the Republicans are inching closer to a majority in the House of Representatives. However, the results have been much, much closer than expected, resulting in Republicans to lament what they see as the biggest missed opportunity of the century which has raised doubts about my next guest's favourite man, Donald Trump's ability to win the presidential election in 2024. Well, to break down this story, I'm joined by a former Trump advisor, Dr Sebastian Gorka. Dr Gorka, thank you very much for your time. I wonder if you can just set out for my viewers, many of whom like Donald Trump, right? Well, I get interview, uh, people writing in saying, look, he's a man. He says it as it is. I like him a lot. They're worried now that actually he's had his chance. He's a busted flush. Yeah, well, there is zero empirical evidence that what we saw, this disaster uh, on Tuesday in the last uh, four days, was anything to do with my former boss. Uh, the majority of the candidates that he supported, he campaigned for and even helped to fund, actually won their elections very much in the Trumpian mold. You've got people like J.D. Vance, the author, the former Marine, never involved in politics and just romped home with a massive victory, first time ever uh, as a Senate candidate out of Ohio. So, you know, the problem is the election system and what the Democrats did to it under COVID. Think of this. In, in the state of Pennsylvania, where an individual called Fetterman, who had a stroke and can't speak properly, who has to have closed captioning at political events because he can't process audio inputs to his brain, was elected the senator. Why? Because of 50 days of voting. The sheer, we, used to, we used to have election day in America. Pennsylvania has 50 days of voting, okay. and more than half of the electorate voted before he even debated the person who is running against him. So we have a broken election system, and we've got to fix it. So, Sebastian, though, a lot of my viewers are watching things kick off in America. They're watching a, a US president who, frankly, struggles sometimes to string a sentence together. And they're saying, hang on a minute, in a country of over 300 million people, this is really the best that the United States can offer. And actually, President Trump is, hasn't covered himself in glory since that election in 2020. I'm wondering... Where do you think the Republican Party goes from here? Do you think Ron DeSantis, who actually has had a good election by the looks of things, do you think he's going to be the Republican nominee? Uh, I think the swamp, I think the fake conservatives, what we call the rhinos, the Republicans in name only, are whispering sweet nothings into Ron's ear right now because they hate Trump. Remember Trump? isn't owned by anybody. He's not owned by the gas companies, the oil companies, the unions. He is his own man. Ron DeSantis is seen as a tool. I, I did a big interview that's going viral on, on, on my, my uh, Twitter page right now, my Instagram page, on how Dan uh, Ronald DeSantis is being used by the establishment as a stalking horse to divide the right. The fact is, President Trump received more votes than any incumbent president in U.S. history. That's just a fact. He is still the kingmaker. If you look at the results across the country, the majority of his nominees won their seats. He has changed conservative politics, just like Brexit changed politics in the U.K. And the, the left, allied with the fake conservatives, wants to take down the king. But it's going to fail. This, this is a guy who can fill a stadium yeah. anywhere in America, including in Democrat states, with 50, 60,000 people two days after he announces an event. That's the power of Donald Trump, and that hasn't waned in the last two years. So yes or no then, Sebastian, is Donald Trump, is it going to be Trump and Biden in 2024? Uh, it will be President Trump. He's going to announce on Tuesday. Uh, will it be Biden? Look, this is a guy who says he's in Colombia when he's in Asia. The, the guy is adult. He's a husky, senile. Can he pull it out for another two years? The Lord only knows. Well, we shall see. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, former advisor to President Trump, thank you very much for your time. Now, remembrance ceremonies have been taking place across Britain this weekend in honour of the brave men and women 
who have made the ultimate sacrifice in defence of our great nation. At 11 o'clock yesterday, a two-minute silence marks the ending of the First World War when guns stopped firing. While paying tribute to those who've serviced, served rather in conflicts since. Our East Midlands reporter has this brilliant package, that's Will Hollis. He joined the British Army at the Kendry Barracks in Rutland for their service and ahead of Remembrance Sunday tomorrow, he sends this report. A sound so familiar to the British Army, yet it's the silence that follows that matters most. At the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, we remember them. Lieutenant Ashwell is with the Royal Anglians. So we are at Kendry Barracks uh, in Cottesmore, Rutland. All of the uh, service personnel on the camp come together with the primary school that is also on camp. And we're coming together to take part in an act of remembrance. For more than a century, Britain has honoured those who've died in conflicts through remembrance. What began as a way to mark armistice and the end of the Great War now highlights all sacrifice made by the armed forces. The importance of today is to remember those who have fallen before us, those who've died um, in world wars, uh, in the Korean War, in conflicts in the Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and also those who've died out of conflict, uh, to remember them, their families and friends. In the heart of Rutland, Kendrew Barracks is home to the army's serving men and women, and often their families. With the school on site, the children at Cottesmore Academy learn of Remembrance Young. Virtually all of our children have a parent who is serving in the armed forces. Some children will even have both parents serving in the armed forces. So it's particularly important that we are part of today. From our biggest cities to our national memorials. For many, remembrance gives time to think of friends and family who've served in the armed forces. For Private Liam Williams back at Kendrew, that's his great-grandparents. It's an absolute honour to be able to serve in the British Army. Um, remembrance Day is a big standing point for me. On both sides of my family, great-grandfathers went off to fight in the Second World War. And it does, it really means a lot, and I believe it means a lot to a lot of other people in the unit. As the British Army moves further forward into the 21st century, Reverend Tom Wilde reminds us how remembrance serves to connect all in the forces. The people living on this camp, um, there's an absolute multitude of different nations, different uh, regiments, different cat badges and all with their own history of uh, conflict and service. And when we remember, what, we, what we're allowing people to do is to remember those who these regiments have lost. The silence observed may be short, but as we look ahead to Remembrance Sunday, the sacrifice it is in place of is beyond words. Will Hollis for GB News in Rutland. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch today about your views on migration. Thank you very much for doing so. James has this to say. Albanian migrants are coming here to turn Britain into another Albania. And because our political class are so inept, they may well succeed. I just hope that hidden somewhere within the establishment of Britain, there is an individual who can show the courage of Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. We need a real leader once again. James, I do think the political class have been utterly supine in their approach to this. Ital Italy's, Italy? Italy's leader said, you're not getting off the boat, right? We need that sort of robust action. Sarah had this to say. Why is the Albanian government not doing anything about their people leaving? Surely they should take some responsibility. Well, Sarah, if people, you know, which is suggested by even the people at the BBC, if there is suggested that people are getting up to criminality when they actually arrive here, why would Albania want them, right? That's what I'm at saying. Anyway, folks, thank you for your emails. Keep them coming in because I am opening them when I get them. You're watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. First up, here's the latest weather forecast. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, with some cloud in the far east and west. Let's take a look at the details. A dry but cloudy evening for most of southwest England, with low cloud and perhaps fog possible over the hills, clearer spells at times, and breezy, particularly at the coasts. Cloudy for some in southeast England, with light winds, allowing some mist and fog to develop under any clearer spells, particularly in the east. Wales will see a cloudy evening on Saturday with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible over the hills, breezy at western coasts. 
Staying dry across the Midlands with plenty of clear skies in the evening and overnight. A little breezy at times, but feeling mild with temperatures around 13 Celsius. Northeast England will see a cloudy evening, although some clearer spells at times. Some low cloud, mist and fog possible, particularly at eastern coast. Light winds and temperatures of 11 or 12 Celsius. Staying dry across most of Scotland with some patchy cloud in places, although outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible in the far west. Generally light winds, but breezy in the west. A cloudy evening across Northern Ireland with some patchy mist and fog, although a few clearer spells possible in the east, feeling breezy, particularly at the coasts and over high ground. Staying dry for most, although patchy rain and drizzle in the east, some clearer spells and breezy in the west. And that's how it's shaping up overnight. This Sunday on Mark Dolan Tonight, my Mark Meets guest is one of the most colourful and controversial politicians in the country, former business secretary Jacob Rees-Mogg. We'll get his views on the economy, on the nurses strike, on Brexit and our new PM Rishi Sunak. That's Jacob Rees-Mogg live on Mark Dolan Tonight, this Sunday from nine. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello, welcome back to Real Britain on your TV, radio and online. Coming up in this next hour, what do you make of calls for mass migration as the answer to solve the cost of living crisis and boost Britain's GDP? I know what I think. And as the head of NATO says we're the perfect example of an alliance member, is it time we're focused on our defence over that of Ukraine? And Suella Braverman axes the requirement for all police officers to have degrees after backlash from chief constables. We're going to debate that later. First up, though, it's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon from the GB Newsroom. It's one minute past three. There have been scenes of jubilation across Ukraine after the liberation of the city of Kherson from Russian control. Kherson was the only regional capital city captured by Russian troops since the invasion began in February. Vladimir Putin's spokesperson has denied the move is a defeat, saying the region remains a part of Russian territory after it was annexed in September. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, says there isn't a single indicator that Russia is sincerely seeking peace talks. The only response we always received from them, even when we sat down at the table, 
was, here is the list of ultimatums, take it or leave it. And the set of these ultimatums meant full capitulation and unconditional surrender of Ukraine. Large groups of migrants have clashed with French police near Dunkirk after the authorities stopped their attempts to cross the channel. Migrants have been seen attacking French police officers with stones and tree branches. Meanwhile, the force used pepper spray to push them back. GB News was told the vast majority of migrants were young men with one or two women and children. Meanwhile, dozens of Albanian nationals are protesting in central London against the British government's immigration policies. Many are still furious about the Home Secretary's comments earlier this month when she likened the number of Albanian asyl asylum seekers arriving in the UK to an invasion. Close to 40,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Britain and France are expected to agree a deal as soon as Monday to ramp up their joint efforts to reduce the numbers. Tory MPs have come out in defence of the Deputy Prime Minister after he was accused of being rude and aggressive towards civil servants. It's reported that multiple sources have alleged Dominic Raab created a culture of fear in his previous role as Justice Secretary. Labour described the accusations as deeply troubling, saying they raise more questions about Mr Sunak's judgment by appointing him. Levelling up Shadow Minister Alex Norris says bullying shouldn't happen in government. It's cowards that bully their staff, people who, in that power imbalance, can't really do very much about it and simply have to put up with uh, what, what we've seen happen. I mean, uh, obviously, we're, we're only reading in the last uh, sort of 24 hours some of the issues relating to the Deputy Prime Minister and what he may or may not have thrown, and it's important that that's given the full airing. But we do know what happened with Gavin Williamson, that's accepted. But fundamentally, I just don't think they should do that, and I don't really think that that should be very controversial. Counting is continuing in the U.S. midterm elections with a race for control of the U.S. Congress neck and neck. Republicans are favourites to win the House of Representatives, securing 211 seats. They need an additional seven seats to secure a majority. But the fight for the Senate is on the edge, with both Republicans and Democrats having 50 votes. The biggest concerns for voters are the economy and abortion rights. The women's England rugby team have suffered heartbreak after losing to New Zealand in the World Cup final. England's Red Roses dominated the first half despite one player getting a red card. But their rivals, the Black Ferns, came back strong, scoring a try in the last nine minutes to give a 34-31 victory. There were record numbers of spectators in the stadium, with more than 40,000 tickets sold. Fans say despite the loss, they're still proud of the team. It could have gone either way for quite a lot of the game, so I think in this room everyone was just really passionate about England women and the Loughborough Lightning girls here, so um, we're all pretty gutted, but we're also really proud of everyone out there. Like It's a massive honour for them to represent the Rose and put on a great performance like they did today. Renowned graffiti artist Banksy has revealed his latest artwork on the side of a damaged building in Ukraine. It shows a female gymnast balancing on her hands on rubble at the bottom of a destroyed building. Murals spotted in and around Kyiv has led to speculation the artist is working in the war-torn country. Another mural, not yet officially claimed by the artist, shows the Russian president being flipped during a judo match with a young boy. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens, of course. Now, though, it's back to Darren. Welcome back to Real Britain. Here's what's coming up over this last hour. Could mass migration be the answer to solving the cost of living crisis and boost our GDP? Well, that's what the CEO of Next, Lord Wolfson, thinks. He said, we've got people queuing up to come to this country to pick crops that are rotten in fields to work in warehouses and that otherwise wouldn't be operable. And we're not letting them in. Does he have a point? We're going to debate the issue. Plus, NATO chief Jen Stoltenberg has said that he is absolutely confident the UK will continue to lead by example on defence expenditure as he lavished Rishi Sunak with praise. But is it time we focused on our own defence rather than that of Ukraine? We'll discuss. And later, Suella Braverman is due to ditch a blanket requirement for all police officers. 
to have degrees after a backlash from chief constables. The Home Secretary said there will still be a non-degree entry route to continue delivering officers of the highest calibre. Well, that's what we're talking about for this next hour. As ever, your thoughts much more important than mine. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. I've got that open here and you can watch us on YouTube. Don't forget Facebook, loads of cracking content on our page there. Cheers very much. Now, as I say, Lord Wilson, chief executive of Next, he's called on the government to relax immigration rules to, as he puts it, alleviate Britain's chronic labour shortages. The Brexit support and peer said that current restrictions on immigration were harming GDP and were definitely not the Brexit that he wanted. However, with visas being issued at the rate of 8,500 a week, that's the highest on record, by the way, and around 5 million Brits on out-of-work welfare, I say the focus should be on trying to get Brits to return to the workplace. Well, joining me to discuss this issue is the international security and border control expert, Henry Bolton. He joins me in the studio. Head of public policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Matthew Lesh, and Reem Ibrahim, political commentator. Thank you very much to all of you. Henry, I'll start with you then. What did you make of Lord Wolfson's comments here? Is this what we need to unlock growth in Britain? I think Lord Wolfson has approached this from the wrong angle. What we need to look at is not where we can get workers for, to su supply the need, but it's why aren't Brits able to do that work? Well, one of the reasons is because just about every European state provides funding for people to retrain, to requalify, to get certain certificates and so on. Here in the UK, we don't. There's no state funding for that. Universities across Europe are free. Here in the UK, they are not. So it's far more difficult for somebody who finds themselves out of a job or somebody who's, who's other, for other reasons, unemployed to requalify, to get the necessary certificates of qualifications to enter the workplace. Now, of course, you know, Lord, Lord Wolfston did refer to uh, the agricultural sector. Indeed, that is a problem. But when we've also got a problem with public transport, you've also got to consider how people who at the moment don't have any money can actually travel there. Now, you know, the way that it's worked in many farms, for, for example, I'm from Kent and around Maidstone, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans have been working around that area, but they are accommodated on site. That, that opportunity is available to uh, workers who come from abroad, but not to UK workers working in the agricultural sector. So there are all sorts of problems there. I say that Lord Wolfston is wrong in his conclusion because I say the way to solve this, first and foremost, is to enable our own workforce to be able to be employed and to requalify for the various posts. And then, only then, if we cannot, if we've exhausted all other opportunities to qualify our own workforce, then we can go and look abroad. But that's the only time I would, I would yeah. say that that's useful to do so. Matthew Lesh at the IEA, I'm wondering, what do you say to my viewers who are looking at that figure, over five million people on out-of-work welfare, and they're saying, well, hang on a minute, shouldn't we start to try and upskill the British people before we allow business to have a free lunch, picking who it wants from the continent of Europe? Look, John, my understanding is I think there's about 5 million people on universal credit, many of whom who are in jobs but then receive some kind of top up to their salary. Now, I have no objection whatsoever to the idea of uh, providing lifetime training opportunities for people who are out of work, for trying to get the people who are out of work, and there's, there's um, something like 1.7 million uh, on look, looking for work on universal credit. You know, the, there's a whole bunch of people who, who can and should look for work. That said, though, we, we shouldn't be silly enough to demonize immigrants uh, and say that they don't make a contribution. The truth is that immigrants make a massive contribution to the UK economy, filling skills gaps where people don't necessarily have the skills uh, in the UK that employers are looking for, uh, be willing to do jobs that um, people domestically just simply don't want to do. You know, people don't domestically necessarily want to spend a few months a year uh, picking fruit on a farm uh, and then not have a job other parts of the year. They're, they're, these jobs are perfectly well suited to immigrants. And, and the fact is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find and enable people domestically to do that. And the consequence of that, according to the National Farmers Union, has been £60 million uh, pounds worth of wasted food. There's also a broader issue, which is that the UK has an ageing population. 
Um, and if we, the UK doesn't have immigrants, it's going to be very difficult to be able to afford the, the public um, services that we're expecting in the future. You need workers to be working today uh, to be able to afford um, all those kind of social benefits on social welfare, on uh, pensions, uh, on the healthcare system. Uh, we know that immigrants make a net contribution to the government, to the welfare system. But immigrants often are more, uh, on average, more productive because a lot of immigrants are obviously very highly skilled. I'm filling certain jobs. We know from the Entrepreneurs Network that about half of the UK's fastest growing businesses have at least one foreign born co founder. That's okay. just 14% of UK residents being foreign born. We know overall, overall um, immigrants make a massive positive contribution to the UK uh, and a clear part, an important part of the labour force story. So, Henry, are you demonising migrants then? Because actually, Matthew Lesh has just pointed out that they're more efficient than British workers. Are we here in this country, on these green and pleasant lands, lazy so-and-sos? I think that's demonising the British people. And, uh, you know, I'd turn it around and say, well, hang on a minute. Why is it that we're not making the effort to upskill our own people, to provide them with the means to go to work, the public transport, if necessary, the accommodation that's available to, to migrant workers and so on. Why aren't we providing British workers with that opportunity when we're, we're providing it to, to migrant workers? I don't understand that. I don't think it's right. And I'm certainly not demonising migrants. What I'm doing is saying we should be putting our, pe our own people into the work market, the job market first by qualifying them as Europeans do. So, for example, if you're a Pole, it is far, far easier to get a driving licence or a Spaniard um, and then and drive in the UK than it is for a UK dr a, 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 somebody like me who doesn't have an HGV to qualify as an HGV driver and get the job. Uh, you know, I'll tell you something that you may not be aware of. The Spanish are so short of drivers to work here that they are now recruiting people from South America, qualifying them in Spain so they can come and work here, drive their trucks here. You know, we can't do that because we have to pay it. The ordinary British worker on benefits has got to find however much money to actually do that, to pay for it himself or herself. OK, That's I, want wrong. To, I want to bring in Reem there, sat patiently. <laughs> Reem, what would you say to voters, 17.4 million of them in 2016, that voted for Leave, many of whom said, look, I actually am concerned about the impacts of, of mass migration to this country, and actually they wanted to see uncontrolled migration brought to an end. What do you say to those Brits who might be saying, well, Lord Wolfson is a million miles away from what I want to see for Britain? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't know where this word mass migration come, came from. Nobody is arguing for mass migration. What we're actually thinking about at the moment is that Lord Wilson is a business owner who has clearly expressed concerns about the lack of uh, lack of low-skilled workers that he can employ in next. I think we've clearly seen now at the moment that there is a labour shortage. We've got about over one. Well, Reem, why doesn't Lord million... Wilson just pay workers more? Then maybe British people will want to join his company. I think that the reason why British workers aren't obviously uh, going off of these benefits and, and going into work is because the benefit system doesn't incentivise them to do so. You can hardly blame them, blame them if they're going to be earning more money staying on the dole than they are going to be earning working in next. Of course they're going to stay on that. I absolutely do not blame business owners like Lord Wolfson who are clearly showing that there is a labour shortage, there are there is clearly a lack of workers. I don't think that asking for more migration is, is the issue. I, Brexit was about controlled migration and it was about actually having sovereignty and having choice in order to choose the amount of migrants that we would like. Businesses are clearly showing that the government is out of step on this. I, I mean, it assumes that the state somehow knows better than businesses about what jobs are needed in the economy. Clearly, businesses are saying we need more. OK. Yeah, Henry, I want to put that... Because Reem there saying mass migration, question mark, because... At the start there, I said 8,500 mm -hmm. visas are being issued a week in this country. A lot of my viewers are saying, well, Darren, that's a pretty large number. Do you think it's a large number? I, I think it's a very large number, incredibly large number, seeing as we are, as I keep saying, we're doing nothing to qualify our present workforce. I mean, if you go on benefits, there are supposedly schemes to help you get back into the workforce, a workplace. There are not. That's the reality of it. That you, you sign on, you get your benefit, you try to get further, you try to get back into the workplace, and all that you've got is a website that tells you where you can apply for jobs. There's virtually no actual practical assistance given to qualifications. But the other thing is, you know, say there's, there's not mass migration. If we take this in the context of what's going on in the round, um, you know, the British people are... And I'm not saying that 
workers coming here legitimately to work on a visa to go to the workplace. I'm not trying to demonise them, but for the British public, writ large, they're seeing problems on the, in the channel. They're seeing huge numbers of people enter the country. Still, net migration is through the roof. And now we're talking about bringing more people on board when actually we've got perfectly fit and healthy people who I can tell you, because I, I've been talking to them, you probably have as well, they want to work, but they simply can't get to do it because the public transport isn't there and the financial s support to requalify isn't there. So we've got... Uh, Lord Wolfston, with all due respect to him, I understand his problem and I understand his concern and Yes, we argued for controlled migration. But controlled migration does not say, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm the boss of next, I want more foreign workers, bring them in. Controlled migration is a much more strategic issue than that. And I think we need to I'm not demonise... I'm repeating again, sorry, I'm not demonising migrants. What I'm saying is we don't need them if we were to qualify our own people first. OK, so, Matthew Lesh, on that point as well, if we say, right, hunky-dory happy days, let's get next... The, the, the labour that it actually needs. Some of my viewers are saying, well, Darren, ask your guests the question, where's the healthcare professionals that are going to look after these people? Where is the, the school places for their children? Where is the homes that you, of course, Matthew, have waxed lyrical about for many years now? Where are those services, those essential services that migrant labour is going to actually need once they arrive here? Well, the truth is that migrants will ultimately end up paying for those services in the same way the rest of us do, through paying uh, very significant rates of tax. Um, so migrants on net, uh, the classic case here is um, Eastern European migrants, even when we were in the EU, on net contributed um, £1,000 extra compared to the average Brit um, in terms of paying taxes. So migrants also make a big contribution when it comes to the cost of their visas as well as the NHS surcharge. They, they tend to be younger and therefore put less burden Onto, onto taxpayers for things like the health service at the same time. So I, I don't think there's a case here that our migrants aren't paying their fair share into the public finances. I do agree with you, Darren, we need to build more homes um, and that we obviously need a, a planning system that enables us to have a bigger population if, if we're going to allow migrants into the country. And I agree with you that there is a bit of a conflict there. But that's not a reason to say we can't have migrants. And it's not a reason just to assume that you can um, make domestic workers want to take jobs that they don't necessarily want to take. That, that, that that's the, the that's where the mismatch comes from is that you Can have I domestic just, workers you might in theory I, want some jobs but domestic workers don't necessarily want to work fruit picking they don't necessarily want to work in retail for next and there is clearly some role for migrants in taking those jobs um and enabling the rest of us to do better high paying jobs as a consequence um no, and, no, and I, don't, I, I, I don't want to hog this but I, 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 if i may come in because mm -hmm. you know nobody's saying that we should have no migrants coming into the workplace. What we're saying is that we don't need so many. And if you, you just talked about the health care, um, one of the reasons that we have to go abroad for nurses is because a Polish nurse, Romanian nurse, Bulgarian nurse, Indonesian nurse, Filipino nurse does not have to pay for their qualification. In the UK, we've got this bizarre situation where we do have to, and therefore people aren't going into the training in sufficient numbers because they know that when they go into the entry level in nursing, they're, they're going to be struggling financially. So, you know, we are setting our, ourselves up for failure in this regard. We are creating a body of people who would like to work, mm -hmm. but simply for various practical and financial reasons can't. And as a result, we don't have the people that, we, that are qualified to recruit into things like nursing, so we have to go to agencies to recruit from abroad. Yeah. This is a ridiculous situation, and I don't think additional migration is the answer. I think so, Reem, on that point then that Henry raises there, isn't it time that the British government prioritise the British people? I think that the, the British government are always going to prioritise the British people, but actually but people make up businesses. Clearly businesses are demanding more migrants and demanding more low-skilled workers. If British people aren't going to take up those jobs, I think that they're absolutely right to want to uh, employ those people abroad. I think the government shouldn't have any right to tell businesses where they can and cannot employ their workers from. OK, we'll have to leave it there, folks, but I think robust remarks from each of you. Thank you very much. That was the international security and border control expert with me in the studio, Henry Bolton, the political commentator, Reem Ibrahim, on the right there, and head of public policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Matthew Lesh. Thank you to each of you for your time. 
Plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain, folks. After the break, NATO Chief Jen Stoltenberg has said that he is absolutely confident the UK will continue to lead by example on defence expenditure as he lavished praise on Rishi Sunak. But is it time we focused on our own defence rather than that of Ukraine? That's my question. First of all, though, let's have a look what the weather's up to. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, with some cloud in the far east and west. Let's take a look at the details. A dry but cloudy evening for most of southwest England, with low cloud and perhaps fog possible over the hills, clearer spells at times, and breezy, particularly at the coasts. Cloudy for some in southeast England, with light winds allowing some mist and fog to develop under any clearer spells, particularly in the east. Wales will see a cloudy evening on Saturday with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible over the hills, breezy at western coasts. Staying dry across the Midlands with plenty of clear skies in the evening and overnight, a little breezy at times but feeling mild with temperatures around 13 Celsius. Northeast England will see a cloudy evening, although some clearer spells at times, some low cloud, mist and fog possible, particularly at eastern coast. Light winds and temperatures of 11 or 12 Celsius. Staying dry across most of Scotland with some patchy cloud in places, although outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible in the far west. Generally light winds, but breezy in the west. A cloudy evening across Northern Ireland with some patchy mist and fog, although a few clearer spells possible in the east, feeling breezy, particularly at the coasts and over high ground. Staying dry for most, although patchy rain and drizzle in the east, some clearer spells and breezy in the west. And that's how it's shaping up overnight. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays.
Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly online and your digital radio. Now, NATO Chief Jen Stoltenberg has said that he is absolutely confident the United Kingdom will continue to lead by example on defence expenditure for the alliance during a visit to the United Kingdom this week. The praise comes amidst uncertainty on whether Rishi Sunak will honour Liz Truss's pledge to increase defence spending to 3% of gross domestic product by 2030, and questions surrounding whether Britain spends enough on its own defence, despite being the largest the second largest, rather, contributor of military aid to Ukraine. Well, joining me, I'm delighted to say, is the former British Infantry Commander, Colonel Richard Kemp. Richard Kemp, thank you very much for your time. What are the arguments that Liz Truss made that resonated with you around keeping to that 3% of gross domestic product on defence? Well, the reality is, of course, that we do have to continue to support Ukraine because it's not just their war, it's our war as well. Russia, by threatening Ukraine and by invading Ukraine, is also a threat to this country and to the rest of Europe. And we also face threats from uh, countries like Iran and China in particular, maybe not immediate, but long in the longer term. And and the problem is that um, the, the, the reality is that... Uh, uh, defence is not just about fighting wars. It has two primary functions. The first is to fight wars, but the second, which is just as important, is to deter war. And if you don't have the right amount of strength and combat capability and equipment and number of troops, then you, your enemies are going to take advantage of that and they're going to think they can invade you and they can or, or attack you in some way. Um, and, and, and you end up having to fight the war that you might have avoided. And that's what happened in Ukraine. As it happens, the Russians got their calculation wrong, but they thought they could easily walk over Ukraine, which proved to be incorrect. So without the necessary uh, expenditure on defence, and it looks like we're not just not going to increase defence spending as Liz Truss suggested she would, but we're, you know, I think there are plenty of rumours about it. We're actually going to cut it even further. So what would, do you think that, the, and I'm asking you to, to get into the mind of the NATO chief here, but Jen Stoltenberg buttering up Rishi Sunak, right? Why do you think he's doing that? Do you think he's conscious of the fact that actually, you know, Jeremy Hunt is ready to wield his axe in the Treasury and actually we should be worried about Rishi Sunak saying 3%, that's far too high? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, it's obviously, you know, Jens Stoltenberg and other senior NATO officials, obviously they have a responsibility to encourage uh, high levels of defence expenditure from NATO members. We're one of the highest, of course, and one of the most effective. Um, second, probably only to the United States of America. But um, I I'm sure that, you know, that that's part of his job anyway. I'm sure that uh, he is concerned about the, the prospects for defence cuts or and, and maybe even, you know, he's worried about the fact that we're not going to increase. We're not really meeting our 2% uh, GDP NATO commitment. It's it's sort of a bit of smoke and mirrors. We're not really meeting it now. But I'm sure he's concerned that, that um, this government will cut. And I'm also as well very concerned about that. They've got huge economic problems. Defence doesn't often, isn't often a vote winner. I, I don't think it'd be a vote winner now. If you look at the the you know the, the the threat of or not just the threat but the the reality of uh, nurses strikes coming up strikes in various other sectors the, the, and, and continually turning to the armed forces the, every government always turns to the armed forces we're not only training the ukrainians and providing them with equipment we're also now about presumably if if there's a um a paramedic strike here in the uk then the army's yeah. being talked about as to help deal with that the That's olympic true. games security everything but they but the government is unwilling to resource them because they, they simply are not seen as a vote winner. And, and that's the, the problem we have. And the, the, the reality is that without providing the necessary funding for defence, you put people's lives at risk, not just our citizens' lives, but our soldiers' lives as well. If they're not fully resourced with the most modern, up-to-date equipment they can have and the most suitable equipment and the numbers they need to fight in a war, then that you know when they do come to fight, which undoubtedly they will at some point, uh, yeah. That puts their lives on the line and, and risks unnecessary deaths among the forces as well as the people in this country. I mean, speaking of, there are many viewers who are of the view that actually the United Kingdom has been involved in far too many foreign disputes that we should never have got involved in. I wonder if 
you have any reflections ahead of Remembrance Sunday, of course, in which fallen British troops fighting for the values that our flag represents. What do you say to those people who say we should be more concerned with our own security than the security of those abroad? Well, I think, you know, people said that when the British government was considering um, fighting in the Second World War, uh, opposing Germany, and there was a huge number of people in this country who, who said, made the same arguments. Uh, it's not really our problem, it's not our war, we should negotiate with Hitler, etc. It was Churchill, and, and pretty much Churchill alone, who, who stood up to Hitler and persuaded the British people that we needed to fight. And I think one, one thing I find lacking in many of our politicians today is that when we do have to engage in a conflict overseas of some sort, they don't necessarily have the, the leadership ability to persuade the British people of that. And that led to deeply unpopular and failed conflicts in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But the fundamental reason to engage there was about our security. It wasn't about Afghanistan okay. and Iraq. It was about our own security. And the same applied when we went and fought in the Falkland Islands. It was about yeah. our security. Yeah, well, we'll have to leave it there. But I thank you, as ever, for your thoughts. That's a former British infantry commander, Colonel Richard Kemp, offering us his thoughts there on Britain's defence expenditure. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. I thank you very much for being. So, after the break, Suella Braverman, she has said she's going to ditch a blanket requirement for all coppers, police officers, to have degrees after a backlash from chief constables. The Home Secretary said there would be a non-degree entry route to continue delivering officers of the highest calibre. Let's discuss that. Now, though, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Here are the top stories at 3.34. There have been scenes of jubilation across Ukraine after the liberation of the city of Kherson from Russian control. Kherson was the only regional capital city captured by Russian troops since the invasion began in February. Vladimir Putin's spokesperson has denied the move as a defeat, saying the region remains part of Russian territory after it was annexed in September. Ukraine's foreign minister says there isn't a single indicator that Russia is sincerely seeking peace talks. Large groups of migrants have clashed with French police near Dunkirk after the authorities stopped their attempts to cross the channel. Migrants have been seen attacking French police officers with stones and tree branches. Meanwhile, the force used pepper spray to push them back. GB News has learned that the vast majority of migrants are young men with one or two women and children. Meanwhile, dozens of Albanian nationals are protesting in central London against the British government's immigration policies. Many are still furious about the Home Secretary's comments earlier this month when she likened the number of Albanian asylum seekers arriving in the UK to an invasion. Close to 40,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Britain and France are expected to agree a deal as soon as Monday to ramp up their joint efforts to reduce the numbers. Tory MPs have come out in defence of the Deputy Prime Minister after he was accused of being rude and aggressive towards civil servants. It's reported that multiple sources have alleged Dominic Raab created a culture of fear in his previous role as a Justice Secretary. Labour described the accusations as deeply troubling, saying they raise more questions about Mr Sunak's judgment by appointing him. TV online at DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip 
of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics and I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your TV, online and on your digital radio. Before we move on this afternoon, I've got loads of you getting in touch about today's topics. Frederick, on the climate debate that we had earlier, he says, if the UK moved all of its carbon emission industries to China, the UK's emissions are reduced and China's emissions are increased. The UK gets to feel good, nothing but virtue signalling. Reparations are a joke and a not-so-funny one at that. Frederick, I couldn't agree with you more. I think COP26, all those clever politicians patting themselves on the back as they send energy-intensive industries abroad. Jobs, good jobs abroad. I think it's a nonsense. Virtue signal and nonsense. Jan has this to say. You speak so much common sense. Oh, thank you very much, Jan. We are elderly in our 70s and worry about the state of this country. Though we have always voted Tory, it's doubtful we will in the future. You're not the only one to say that, Jan. Richard Tice and the Reform Party are our best hope for the sake of our grandchildren and their families. Well, Jan, it's going to be interesting. Richard Tice's party bouncing in the polls. Is that going to continue? We shall see. Wendy on the climate protesters has this to say. Why are we not shouting stop the deforestation? We can act on this now. Our forests absorb CO2. Why do these eco-zealots not start planting trees instead of campaigning and annoying hard-working families by gluing themselves to the road? Why indeed, Wendy, why indeed? Danny has this to say on the nurses' strike. I don't agree with the strike. If the nurses can't live on 34000 a year, then they must be living above their means. Look at the people working in factories who are on far less and work just as hard as the rest of us. I always said we should implement an NCS, National Care Service, where proper selected school leavers do a two to three year service in the NHS. Yeah, Danny, I think more sort of apprenticeship style roles where people are on site, that's the answer. And it's the answer for our policing debate, I think, which we're gonna have in a minute. Sue on the debate over low skilled migration offers this. There's brilliant state of the art machines that can pick even the softest fruits. Modern mechanisms in farming, industry and medicine can remove the need of a labour-intensive working force. But as a nation, we've become too reliant on cheap immigrant labour instead of investing in the future. So that might, you may well be onto something there. I think far too many companies, big business, have been far too willing to get a free lunch from migrant labour. Anyway, moving on now. The Home Secretary has dropped the push for all new police recruits to hold a degree. You need a degree for everything these days. The move was ditched after police commissioners warned the requirement would severely limit recruitment options in an already understaffed service. The College of Policing, however, has defended the higher education approach, saying it gives officers the appearance of professionals and allows them to be more understanding of the pressures of the job. Well, with me now is Mark Jones, Police and Crime Commissioner for Lincolnshire, and Ian Itchison, Senior Advisor at the Counter Extremism Project. Mark, can I start with you, please? Do you welcome this move by the Home Secretary? Because a lot of my viewers are saying, why do you need a degree for everything these days? Well, I, I absolutely do support the Home Secretary in this. I think it's a really important move to get the broadest 
um, group of people into policing we can. People that are on second, third careers, maybe have served in the military, um, people who for English isn't necessarily their first language. So a whole range of different people. But um, the College of Policing, I'd have to say, are doing an incredible job at raising leadership standards in policing. I just don't think that making every new recruit attain a degree is the right way to do that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering then, do you think actually this will improve and actually have more people want to get into the police force? Do you think actually that the, the fact that you need as a prerequisite a degree was a deterrent from people actually saying, right, I'd, I'd like to pursue this actually? Well, what I think is right is that the college have provided a whole range of new options. So you can join with a degree, you can attain one while you're training, but also this other route will mean that for those that don't wish to go that way, policing can still be a career for them. It's right to say that the rigors of modern policing have changed. Digital forensics, for example, uh, making sure that all of the training covers all of, all of what the public would expect them to do. But I think that does fall short of needing a degree to be able to do that. So we need people out on the streets learning their craft in the way that they always have with policing. But it's absolutely right to say that we do need good quality leadership training throughout their career to make them the best officers they can be. But I think this is an absolutely right move to get that balance right. Yes, and I wonder then to what extent you agree with the, the Home Secretary on another point that she made recently, Mark, where she said, actually, we need less PC, as in political correctness, and more PCs. Do you agree with that sentiment? Well, it's, it's always easy to distill a complex thing down to a, a single soundbite or sentence. And when I've sat with the Home Secretary and, and spoke about this, it's clear she's got some very um, clear views that I would support. But equally, I think they can be misinterpreted by others. So from my point of view, making sure policing can communicate with and represent every part of our community is really vital to the policing mission. And I think that that's not being PC. But equally, um, we need the officers to be professional. It's a uniform service. They, we need them to be there without fear or favour to serve us all. And I think it's important they don't look that they support one cause over another. So getting that balance right is really important. So I think she's right in that regard. Is there an issue of, of sheer numbers? Is that the problem with the... A lot of my viewers are immensely frustrated with what they perceive to be a lack of law and order in modern-day Britain. Is that a numbers issue? Is it a numbers game that we're playing here? Well, I don't actually um, accept that there's a lack of law and order across the piece. I mean, we all want to see less crime, less um, uh, disorder. I mean, of course we do, and that's absolutely the mission. But when you look at the crime survey for England and Wales, which is people's actual experience of crime, we're looking at the lowest figures uh, for 20 years around most of the crime types. So, you know, I think policing is doing a good job at bearing down on those things. We need to free them up from red tape. I mean, some of the issues around the way they have to record crime, 600 pages of guidance from the Home Office at the minute, 26 ways to close a crime file. Well, most of us would rather they were learning 26 ways of how to catch a burglar than doing that. So the Home Secretary is clear she wants that too, and we want that on behalf of our community. So I'm sure those common sense, practical approaches will be delivered in, in coming months, which is great to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, that sentiment about prioritising the the fact that we've, we, you know, we want our cops to be catching criminals and, and not filling out 26 ways of closing a file. But just, just finally, because we, we lost Ian, sadly, I would have liked to have gotten his, his opinion, but the issue around uh, uh, being far too interested in tweets instead of our streets, is that a fair analysis of the situation that is, is prevalent in, in modern policing? Because the, the perception is that actually what we've got and I don't doubt that were I a copper, I'd rather be sat scrolling through Twitter than I would out on the streets with, with knives and whatever else is going around it these days. Is that an issue that you have found within your own patch? Well, I'd have to say, Darren, I think if you were a police officer, you wouldn't prefer to be sat looking at Twitter. You would want to be out on the streets. The kind of people that join the police 
want to keep their community safe. That's what drives them to do this. So they want to be away from their desk, away from red tape, out keeping the community safe, preventing crime, tackling crime. That's what every police officer I've ever met wants to do. So I see it as our job, the government's job, the commissioner's jobs to help them do that. So I don't believe police officers want to sit trawling through Twitter. However, there are laws that say under certain circumstances, they have to investigate crimes that are reported to them about online activity. Now, if the government wishes to change the law, that means the police won't have to spend their time doing that. But until that happens, the police will need to investigate certain things. But I fully support every officer I've ever met who says, I just want to get my job done. I want to keep my community safe. They haven't got time or inclination to be worried about Twitter, believe me. Yeah, well, Mark, I, I, I dare say many of my viewers are of the view that actually that the law should be changed and they're wondering after 12 years of Conservative government just what on earth they've been doing for all that time. But I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that particular question. Well, we've seen some of the most far-reaching and pro-law and order legislation in um, that period of time. I mean, we, the Courts and Sentencing um, Act is absolutely incredible for driving that forward. We've got laws uh, around domestic abuse, violence against women and girls, a whole raft of things which do help keep us all safe. So I would have to say it's been one of the most proactive times for government in driving forward law and order. So, I, you know, we, of course we all want to see more. Of course we do. But we have got 20,000 additional officers coming online from where we were. That's very welcomed by every community. Our job is to make them as active as possible out on the streets delivering a reduction in crime, which is what everybody wants, and especially every one of those new recruits. OK, Mark Jones, we'll leave it there. That's Mark Jones, PCC, Police and Crime Commissioner, quite the tongue twister, for Lincolnshire. Thank you very much for your time. Folks, I want to talk to you now about the UK's nightclub scene. Now, it's in dire straits. A new report has revealed that 2,000 clubs have closed since 2006. British clubs are closing at a rate of two a week, taking with them numerous other economic opportunities linked to them, such as cafes and takeaways. The industry is a massive gainer for the UK economy, grossing over two billion quid, but the pandemic, noise complaints, the rising cost of rent, you name it, have contributed to its decline. Well, with me now to discuss this is Michael Kill, CEO of Nighttime Industries Association. Michael, is, it, is, it, is there an element of the next generation, today's young people, are abstaining from alcohol and, and, and nightclubs and all the rest of it? And actually, you're facing a generational issue because the next generation aren't using nightclubs as often as perhaps mine did. Uh, you would say that, but when you look at the clubs that are available, it is, you know, they're very busy. Um, the age groups that we're talking about are coming out, the Gen Zs are coming out, listening to electronic music, going out to commercial venues to socialise. So there is definitely a need for it. The challenge that we have is the current operating costs within uh, the current environment, given the, the cost inflation crisis, is crippling the industry. Not just nightclubs, but right the way across the nighttime economy and hospitality sector. Uh, most of them are seeing a 15% drop in trade because people uh, have got less disposable income, 30% plus increase in costs. And we're all waiting to hear what the budget's going to be uh, when it comes out on the 17th, which, which could really signal one way or another whether businesses are going to decide to close altogether. Yeah, I mean, Michael, I, I personally think it would be a, a, a real, it would be a real loss, actually. I mean, some of my fondest memories have been spent in nightclubs, I, I do readily admit. But I'm wondering then, is this a question of over-regulation? Because I dare say lockdowns didn't do you any favours. And I'm wondering what can actually be done for government to make nightclubs' lives, owners of nightclubs' lives, a hell of a lot easier and potentially save an entire industry? 
Well, without a doubt. I mean, look, we are an over-regulated um, industry, um, and, and I think that's been criti criticised right the way across the board. I think the challenge that we have is actually going to appreciate nightclubs have been closed down, you know, whether you're in a devolved government in Wales, Scotland or England. Westminster uh, took it upon themselves to, to close nightclubs altogether for quite elongated periods of time. And what we did during that period is lost a lot of independent, um, you know, family-owned businesses, which are vitally important to small towns and uh, smaller cities across the country. And now what we're seeing is with the double dip in terms of the crisis and moving into cost inflation uh, issues, we are seeing again, uh, but with higher stakes, challenges around not only nightclubs, but wet lead sale businesses, because there is no reprieve. There's no let up for it. So what we do need is a very concerted effort for government to actually look at industries specifically, they're at the sharpest end, and to work out a way of giving them some financial headroom to survive this very challenging period. OK, Michael Cale, CEO of Nighttime Industries Association there, making the case of how we save Britain's nightclubs. Thank you very much. Now, folks, the UK is, is to strike a major science research deal with Switzerland after both countries were shut out of the EU's Horizon Scheme. The agreement will be focused on areas like artificial intelligence and research and development. It's also been described as a signal to many in the scientific community to deepen existing ties and start new projects. Both countries have tried to join the EU scheme but were barred entry for political reasons. Well, joining me now is Peter Clever, editor of in chief of the Brussels Report. Peter, thank you for your time. What do you make of this new agreement? Is this a sign that Brussels is clamping down on those who aren't members of the EU from joining its science projects? Well, quite. Um, I mean, we should not um, consider the UK or Switzerland small players in the academic field. Um, 10 of the 20 top research institutions in Europe are either in Switzerland or the United Kingdom. Uh, so I think that tells you all you need to know. It is just bizarre, really, that the EU is refusing um, those countries to cooperate. Indeed, as you say, for political reasons. Fundamentally, the EU is uh, making all kinds of demands that have nothing to do with uh, scientific cooperation. And uh, Switzerland and the UK are rightly uh, wary to just give in um, to that, uh, just like that. And uh, as a second best option, they start with closing a deal with each other. Yeah. And do you actually think this is going to lead to a, a boost in your scepticism in countries like Switzerland who are saying, well, hang on a minute, why are we being punished? You know, we're not the bad guys. Well, it's certainly not going to promote um, support for the EU, but I mean, there's no way on earth that Switzerland wants to uh, join the European Union. What has happened yeah. is that um, the EU has said, look, uh, we want to change the relationship that we have and you need to accept an arbiter. So far, that's fair, you know, uh, an arbiter in case um, there's disputes in the relationship between the EU and Switzerland. But uh, the EU has added it needs to be. Uh, or own a uh, top uh, court, which is not really fair to, to sort of put your own top um, judicial authority as the arbiter in case of disputes. Yeah, so is this a case of, in your view, is this a case of the EU cutting off its nose to spite its face? Yes, of course, because uh, also academic institutions in Europe are the victim of this uh, lack of cooperation. It's especially in the academic field, which is very international. Um, it's, it's of the utmost importance to, uh, to cooperate. And we've seen petitions from uh, academics all across the continent, many of them that are hostile to Brexit, uh, but that say, look, I mean, uh, we need cooperation here. This is very important. And yeah. specifically when it comes to cooperation with the UK, the EU says, no, no, first we need a deal um, uh, on Northern Ireland before yeah. we can talk about other yeah. things. OK, Peter Kleber, we're going to leave it there. That's Peter Kleber, editor-in-chief of the Brussels Report, with his insight on that move by the EU. Folks, as have been watching Real Britain, I thank you very much for doing so. For now, I'm going to leave you for the weather. I'll be back next weekend.
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, with some cloud in the far east and west. Let's take a look at the details. A dry but cloudy evening for most of southwest England, with low cloud and perhaps fog possible over the hills, clearer spells at times, and breezy, particularly at the coasts. Cloudy for some in southeast England, with light winds allowing some mist and fog to develop under any clearer spells, particularly in the east. Wales will see a cloudy evening on Saturday with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible over the hills, breezy at western coasts. Staying dry across the Midlands with plenty of clear skies in the evening and overnight, a little breezy at times but feeling mild with temperatures around 13 Celsius. Northeast England will see a cloudy evening, although some clearer spells at times. Some low cloud, mist and fog possible, particularly at eastern coast. Light winds and temperatures of 11 or 12 Celsius. Staying dry across most of Scotland with some patchy cloud in places, although outbreaks of light rain and drizzle possible in the far west. Generally light winds but breezy in the west. A cloudy evening across Northern Ireland with some patchy mist and fog, although a few clearer spells possible in the east, feeling breezy, particularly at the coasts and over high ground. Staying dry for most, although patchy rain and drizzle in the east, some clearer spells and breezy in the west. And that's how it's shaping up overnight. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flop at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Good afternoon, it is four o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy, and also GB News presenter, Father Calvin Robinson. Oh, hang on, I'm in there as well. <laughs> Before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Thank you, Nana. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Large groups of migrants have clashed with French police near Dunkirk after the authorities stopped their attempts to cross the channel. Migrants have been seen attacking French police officers with stones and tree branches. Meanwhile, the force used pepper spray to push them back. GB News was told the vast majority of migrants were young men with one or two women and children. 
Meanwhile, dozens of Albanian nationals are protesting in central London against the British government's immigration policies. Many are still furious about the Home Secretary's comments earlier this month when she likened the number of Albanian asylum seekers arriving in the UK to an invasion. Close to 40,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Britain and France are expected to agree a deal as soon as Monday to ramp up their joint efforts to reduce the numbers. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says Russia's retreat from the city of Kherson marked what he calls another strategic failure for Moscow as he pledges continued support for Ukraine. There have been scenes of jubilation across Ukraine after the liberation of Kherson from Russian control. It was the only regional capital city captured by Russian troops since the invasion began in February. Vladimir Putin's spokesperson has denied the move as a defeat, saying the region remains part of Russian territory after it was annexed in September. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kaliba says there isn't a single indicator that Russia is sincerely seeking peace talks. The only response we always received from them, even when we sat down at the table, was here is the list of ultimatums, take it or leave it. And the set of these ultimatums meant full capitulation and unconditional surrender of Ukraine. Tory MPs have come out in defence of the Deputy Prime Minister after he was accused of being rude and aggressive towards civil servants. It's reported that multiple sources have alleged Dominic Raab created a culture of fear in his previous role as Justice Secretary. Labour described the accusations as deeply troubling, saying they raise more questions about Mr Sunak's judgement by appointing him. Levelling up Shadow Minister Alex Norris says bullying shouldn't happen in government. It's cowards that bully their staff, people who, in that power imbalance, can't really do very much about it and simply have to put up with uh, what, what we've seen happen. I mean, uh, obviously, we're, we're only reading in the last uh, sort of 24 hours some of the issues relating to the Deputy Prime Minister and what he may or may not have thrown, and it's important that that's given the full airing. But we do know what happened with Gavin Williamson, that's accepted. But fundamentally, I just don't think they should do that, and I don't really think that that should be very controversial. Essex police say an officer injured during Just Stop All protests earlier this week has thanked the public for their support. The crash on the M25 involved two lorries as eco-activists blocked traffic on Wednesday. Police say the airbags deployed after the officer was thrown from his motorbike. The officer has asked to remain nameless but is recovering from his injuries. Well, counting continues in the U.S. midterm elections with the race for control of the U.S. Congress neck and neck. Republicans are expected to win the House of Representatives, but the Senate races are too close to call, with both Republicans and Democrats having 49 votes. The biggest concerns for voters are the economy and abortion. The women's England rugby team have suffered heartbreak after losing to New Zealand in the World Cup final. England's Red Roses dominated the first half despite one player getting a red card. But their rivals, the Black Ferns, came back strong, scoring a try in the last nine minutes to give a 34-31 victory. There were record numbers of spectators in the stadium with more than 40,000 tickets sold. Fans say despite the loss, they're still proud of the team. It could have gone either way for quite a lot of the game, so I think in this room everyone was just really passionate about England women and the Loughborough Lightning girls here, so um, we're all pretty gutted, but we're also really proud of everyone out there. Like It's a massive honour for them to represent the Rose and put on a great performance like they did today. And renowned graffiti artist Banksy has revealed his latest artwork on the side of a damaged building in Ukraine. It shows a female gymnast balancing on her hands on rubble at the bottom of a destroyed building. Murals spotted in it and around Kiev has led to speculation the artist is working in the war-torn country. Another, not yet officially claimed by Banksy, shows the Russian president being flipped during a judo match with a young boy. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Nana Queer. So good afternoon. It is fast approaching seven minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. You're with me. I'm Nana Queer. 
OK, now, I understand that people fleeing persecution will have to make a perilous journey to reach a safe country and that the safety of France will uh, attempt a further crossing. Some of them, once they reach there, will attempt a further uh, peril to cross the Channel out of choice to build a life here in the UK. Maybe they've got family here. And who can blame them? On the whole, this country is pretty amazing. People fought for the freedom of every citizen here. But is this the behaviour of desperate people fleeing persecution from, from the safety of France, or is it an organised mob looking to get their own way and cross the channel at all costs? You decide. Take a look. So if you're listening on radio, that's a mob of people hurling makeshift weapons, missiles, rocks and all sorts, and they're mainly men. Last night, GB News filmed large swathes of people heading towards the dunes and woods near the beach to launch dinghies in France. Now, the French authorities expecting this would happen because bad weather had stopped the illegal crossings for about two weeks were out in force as hundreds of migrants headed towards the village of Gravelines on the coast for a mass launch of small boats. Basically, large groups of migrants then clashed with the French police, hurling rocks and missiles after their attempts were thwarted. And between five to 6,000 people are currently hanging about in a load of makeshift camps around Dunkirk, which is near Gravelines, waiting for their chance to cross the channel. Would you call that an invasion? I would. I mean, I'd be pretty annoyed if I lived around there. I can only imagine what the people on the southern coast of this country are dealing with. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't assist those in real need, but this is an organised racket, and someone somewhere is making a whole heap of cash out of this misery. Now, one source told GB News that the people smuggling gangs have become very experienced in reading both wind and tide in the channel. It wouldn't surprise me if they were funding the charity supporting the appeals by migrants when they get to the UK. So it was quite good to see Rishi and Macron talking, even if they did look a bit slimy together. The UK government has agreed to pay the French an additional £60 million to help boost the security presence along the French coast. Finally, the UK and France working together closely. The childish blame game has stopped because it's in both of our interests. Now, if Rishi can pull this off and protect the UK's borders, he's on to an election winner. So before we get stuck into the debate, here's what else is coming up today for the Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, has the civil service become drunk on power? Now, the Public and Commercial uh, Services Union, which represents civil servants, uh, basically those mostly in uh, government bodies, so, for example, the Home Office, voted in favour of strike action. Now, its president stated that its key demand was to oust the Tory party from power. They actually said that is actually put down. However, the civil service is meant to remain politically neutral and implement policies created by the government in charge. They're not supposed to go all hell for leather and decide who should be in control and then work their best aim to get out the current incumbent. This all calls into question whether democracy is under threat in the UK. Have civil servants become drunk on power? Then at final 4.50, it's Royal Roundup time and Royal biographer Angela Levin will be live in the studio with an update on all the latest going on. And on the menu, the antics from I'm a Celebrity, have you seen all that? Where Zara Phillips' husband, Mike, is a camp mate. He does such a good job. Did you see the bit where he, he took the spider down? What a man, man! Probably not supposed to say that. Rumours from the palace suggest that the royals aren't too pleased with his appearance. Really? I think he's doing a good job. Anyway, at five, it's this week's difficult conversation. Anti-bullying week is set to commence on Monday and to help shine a light on the issue, uh, which is prevalent of all ages. Bullying, which can lead to people feeling isolated and lonely, uh, can also lead to mental health problems. So joining me live is the CEO of the charity, uh, uh, the Diana Award, which was founded in honour of Princess Diana. And also, uh, they'll be talking about the campaign. That's on the way in the next hour. As ever, tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Right, let's get started. Let's welcome again to my panel broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and also GB News presenter Father Calvin Robinson. Right, I'm going to start uh, with you, Father, because obviously uh, we're, talking, we're talking tough here, migration. Uh, finally, it feels like 
the British and French working a little bit more closely together. Mm. What are you? What's your perception of this? Oh, I don't buy it. I don't think it's in France's interest to work with us. They want rid of these migrants as much as we do. I think we've got to look bigger, uh, further afield, and look at what's actually going on. Why are the majority of migrants crossing the channel illegally Albanian? Mm. Why are the vast majority of them supporting these illegal gangs that are people smuggling, that are, are contributing to the detriment of our society? And what is the cause of that situation? So what's going on in Albania? Mm. We have an illegitimate government. We have uh, a lot of gang crime. What, how can we help Albania solve their problems so that people aren't fleeing to come over here and work on weed farms? Well, you, you have the... Is it President or Prime Minister? I don't know which one they've got, but the, he, he was there talking about the, the, the situation and he basically said that at one point we were sort of seen as a, a great nation and now what's happening is almost laughable in terms of our politics, which I can't disagree with him on that. But uh, he didn't sound like he was uh, at all understanding what the situation is. It sounded like he was almost saying that we are being unfair to the Albanians. And actually, there's a protest in unfair. London today. Well, there's a protest in London today, isn't it? With a lot of yeah, people from Arthur, Albania Arthur saying Arthur it's not fair. I've never seen that anything worse. Being, yeah. We had Armistice Day yesterday. We've got Remembrance Sunday tomorrow. And what, they, what have they done? They've gone and put the Albanian flag over mm. Winston Churchill's statue. I think that is utterly disrespectful. You're in someone else's home. Have some respect. Mm. Yeah, Lizzie, it's disgusting. Well, well, it's alarming. I totally agree.